Alrighty, let's get to it. Um, let's see. So, regarding the midterm, by the time we complete class, you will have had answers to all the questions on the midterm. Assuming you did the reading, assuming you paid attention to all the slides and lectures, and anyway, you have a week, because, um, yeah, it only takes an hour to do it, so don't take a week. <laughs> My preference. So, uh, it will be up... Um, I'll put it up by the end of class and hand it out physically at the end of class, too. They're the same one. Yeah, they're the same okay, one. So and it's not automated, so it'll just be a Word file. Got that? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so people have asked about the next, next term's pro class, uh, CPSY 200, Understanding Addictive Behavior. There are the CRNs for the in-studio class like this, and um, there's no prerequisites for it. Uh, so you could take one after the other, but, and uh, distance le learning uh, three, uh, 31389. I don't have a Cottage Grove one, but uh, it's probably in their catalog too. There's five seats down there. So, do you remember this word, conscientious as own? Somewhere? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, all right. So, just to review for a second, it's the, it's the Portuguese word which means learning to perceive social, political, and economic contradictions and to take action against oppressive elements of reality. Uh, there isn't really a word for that in English. Conscientious doesn't really get it. So the idea of what conscientious is on is, is I'm essentially teaching you out of... Um, there's no easier, gentle way of saying this, but it comes out of uh, African-American culture. Even though it's a Brazilian educator, basically what he's talking about is that there are structures in society that put, keep, are designed to keep people in place. If there's an above ground economy, there's an underground economy. And there's an underground economy for a reason, to get things done that the above ground economy can't do. As an example, when Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan were saying, just say no, the data from the household survey, which is basically the government funding researchers to call people up at their home and ask about their drug use, scientifically. And it's anonymous, so your name's not gonna be connected with it, so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who's using drugs? Who's using illegal drugs? So the household survey in the 80s, when Ronald Reagan said that, just say no thing, indicated that 80% of the illegal drug users in America were white men who made in excess of $50,000. 80%. Okay, so you mean the underground economy for like cocaine, heroin, whatever, exists to serve those guys? And then so that same survey then said, okay, the next 13% is white women. Who may or may not be married to those white guys, but whatever. And then all minorities put together was 7%. So if you're doing the math, 80% are white guys making 50 grand, 13% are white women, at least 7%. Black people at the time were 3% of that number. Okay, so 3% of the illegal drug users in the country in the 80s were black people. Guess who's going to jail? Huh, is it because the white guys have better lawyers? 
only partially. No, the cops ain't going after them by choice. And even when the cops make the choice to go after New York stockbrokers, like there was a book written by this DEA agent that, wait, we, we, it's clear that the problem is not in Harlem. Like the rich white guys are going up to Harlem to get their dope and they're going back to the suburbs. So the problem is Wall Street. So we're gonna bust Wall Street. And they did that for two weeks until the mayor shut them down. Wait, how does the mayor of a city trump federal police about crime? It's not what you know, it's who you know. So we continue to have an underground economy because the people that are using the drugs, we're not going to bust. We've made that decision. So what about the rest of us? Because I ain't a white guy that makes in excess of $50,000, but I do make in excess of $50,000, but I'm not part of the problem. So what about the rest of us? Okay, so that's conscientious as down. I'm talking about it, I see the structure. If you are in recovery, or even not in recovery, and you're helping, using, taking this class to help get deeper into recovery, even if it's like a day or whatever, right? There's barriers in front of you, and I have to, in order to get you through the barriers, I have to let you know <laughs> this is the barrier, okay? And it will remain a barrier until you see how it's put together and what's holding it in place. Doesn't necessarily matter who's in the White House. Well, it does, but... Again, the structure is independent of the political parties. So if you're going to basically not be crushed by it, you have to stay out of its way. And that means avoiding predictable traps. So, in the wisdom way of the teacher, the teacher prepares the mind of the student for battle. So in the practice of conscientious Zazam, teachers are learners and learners teach from their experience. So when I'm training drug counselors, we cannot train street wisdom. There is no book that does that. You learn from the College of Hard Knocks, but it don't give degrees except that you survived or you didn't. You did time or you didn't. So Paolo Freire talked about teacher learners, those who had degrees from domesticated education, and learner teachers, those who had degrees from the school of hard knocks. So sometimes when you lose, you win. Sometimes when you win, you lose. So explain the first phrase, sometimes when you lose, you win. Like, you're trying, you're striving to get somewhere and you get stopped by a barrier. And it's not so much that you got stopped, but it's how you got stopped that's instructive. Oh, they didn't really want me to complete that doctoral program. Not because I wasn't a good student. I'm talking about myself, okay? 3.5 average GPA in a doctoral program at OSU, public health. Here's what I was training people to do. Here's how you get people out of drug dealing gangs. Because I've done it. Here's how you do it. You teach the gangs pro-social skills that meet their needs so they don't have to be in gangs anymore. Well, that's crazy, Mark. There's, where's the book about that? Uh, I'm just telling you what I've done. I could write up the book, but that's why I'm getting a PhD, so that, I, that it means more when I have PhD. I could just train people to do it. That's what I'm being paid to do at Lane. Like when you come to me for counseling, I basically tell people, look, 
I turn clients into practitioners. That's what I do. So that's part of the price you're paying. You're going to be a client with me? I'm going to train you to get other people free. You willing to take, do that? Then I'll help you in any way I can. That's dangerous shit. Especially for the people that make money off of putting people in prison and keeping them in prison in an unending merry-go-round. That's dangerous. Do we want somebody with a PhD teaching people how to do that? So I got kicked out. And it's not that I got kicked out. Not got a, that I got kicked out because I'm dumb. It's that I believe that when they said, we want you to succeed. Oh, well then, why didn't you help me here? Because the only thing new you were teaching me was math. Nothing else. So why do I have to take five <laughs> different statistics courses? Hmm. Tell me how much, knowing what a chi scare is helps me get the person out of gangs. Well, there's no relation. Why am I having to do this? Then? I hadn't even gotten to the math yet. So sometimes when you lose, you win. I didn't, I got kicked out. I kept doing what I'm doing and it's working without having a doctorate. Sometimes when you win, you lose. Because sometimes they let you win and show you that the system works. When it's not working for everyone. So getting through it, oh, see, they made it. You else can too. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't barriers for you. We'll trip you up somewhere else. So that's what I'm saying. The barriers exist. They are real. It's not you. So I can give you other examples, but... Sometimes the change you seek is within yourself and the hearts of those you influence rather than unresponsive systems. I talked with two students today that were, had not so nice interactions with other faculty members. And they're angry. I said, you're right to be angry. However, you can't say what you're thinking because they have power over you. So what you need to be able to do is take that anger and focus it in a way that gets your point across without insulting the idiot that's in front of the classroom. Now I can say that I have academic freedom because sometimes I'm the idiot and I'll be, look, you can challenge me, it's okay. It's not going to hurt your grade because I will cop to it. I'll try anyway. It might sting, but it's okay. Let's tell the truth about what's going on. Sometimes the change you seek is within yourself and the hearts of those you influence rather than unresponsive systems. So as an example, I lost in a community effort to deal with a juvenile justice system. I'm, I'm just calling them out. A juvenile justice system that's actually typical for systems across the country. So we find you get better results when you follow the scientific medical protocol all the time with everybody. Now some people get denied medical treatment because of their excellent suntan or the size of their parents' pocketbook if they're white kids. Why would we deny people, like, addiction is a medical problem? Why do we choose to treat it as if it's a criminal behavior? Okay, the science says criminal addicts will continue repeating criminal behavior as long as they're addicted. Cure the addiction first. Recognize it first. Do they do that? No. Well, only if your parents have a big enough pocketbook. Oh, did I say that out loud? So when I call them on it and I say, I need you to give me disaggregated data about all the people who have drug inf infractions. 
Disaggregated means separated out the wad by race. What do you do generically? Oh, well, kid has a pot ticket or a, other, a Dewey or something like that. First offense, a letter gets sent home. Okay? What about a second offense? Second offense, we refer them to treatment. Okay, good. Show me the disaggregated data. Now I'm talking about 1989 to 1991 when I first asked Serbu this question. Serbu actually didn't exist then, but it's that system, right? So they showed me the data and I said, okay, here's a black girl, nine offenses, no treatment. Here's a Latino boy, five offenses, no treatment. Here's a Native American kid. Now, his tribe will actually pay for treatment. Seven offenses, no treatment. Explain that. Did I get angry? Just calm. This is the numbers. It's your numbers. Numbers don't lie. Explain that. You said everybody gets treatment after one or two offenses, even the white kids. And, oh, your data is showing that more white kids are going into treatment, but same offenses. And so I just happened to know because I had a kid at Churchill, black kid, only black kid in a um, car full of white kids from Churchill smoking weed. They all got pot tickets. All the white kids got treatment. The black kid got time in Serbu and then essentially free falled into the adult system where I saw him again after he had gotten out of prison and I was the first treatment experience that he had. Needless to say, I was kind of upset at that. But still, when we basically, a group of us came up against that system again, said, give me disaggregated data for all your programs. Now, not just the drug program, all your programs. Anybody that's receiving a dollar of your money, they refused. How can you refuse? I'm a citizen, I'm a taxpayer, and I'm a group, we're a group of taxpayer. We have evidence to show that you are discriminating by not getting medical treatment to the people who need it. We have that data.